You know, maybe in childhood or even as an adult, you've been to a very rural area. Have you ever been there? Maybe you grew up there. So what kind of picture do you think of when you think about a rural area with shepherds? You think about that, right? Usually. So we think about sheep. The sheep are going in front of them, and there's two guys on the horse behind them. That's what we usually see, right, here in Kazakhstan. But when we're talking about Israel, it's a completely different picture. It's this picture. The shepherd goes before, and the sheep are behind. That was always amazing to me. Why do they do that to uh, graze their flock? And so, what is your relationship with Jesus? Is it the first picture, or is it the second picture? Which one do you want? The second picture, right? Let's talk about these two different types of uh, caring for the flock. We'll talk about shepherds here. We're going to continue in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 24, I believe. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep listen to his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts all his own sheep outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. However, a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus told them this figure of speech, but they did not understand the things which he meant he was saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All those who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters the flock. He flees because he is a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. Dissension occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the words of one who is demon-possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of those who are blind. Can it? Amen. The goal of the Gospel of John is to show that Jesus is the Son of God. From the very first chapter, the people that are reading this who have believed in Jesus, they're focusing in on the, the Messiah, that everyone could see that Jesus, the Messiah, is the Son of God. So John uses many different ways to try to show this. Jesus does miracles. He preaches. But in all of this, he shows that he is the Son of God, that he came to die for people and save the world. One interesting method is that he uses this I am phrase 
Remember in the Old Testament when Moses asked uh, God, who should I say that sent me? What is your name? And God replied, I am who I am. That is God. And so seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is using the I am phrase. I am the true vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. And here in this one, we have one more important message. He says, I am the door of the sheep and I am the good shepherd. And both of these truths Jesus says twice in this chapter. Remember, when Jesus says the truly, truly, it means Jesus, God is trying to uh, show you something very important. So two times he says that I am the door and that I am the good shepherd. So, <laughs> when I was uh, a child, I went on a summer break to the village to help my uncle. And in this village, everyone had maybe 10 or 15 sheep, everybody. And so there was this kind of thing where everyone would take a turn to take the whole entire flock out into pasture. So, so two times uh, a month, two days at a time, you take the flock out. I went out for the first time. The first day, it was super easy. It's a flat land, the step. It wasn't that hard to see anything. You just go out, you just walk them, and it's easy. So on the second day, I took it easy. I took the, the flock out, but then I found like a little nice place where there was a tree and some shade. I laid down and fell asleep. I woke up, the sun had gone down. I'm sorry, no. So he was sweating. He was sweating, he woke up, and he doesn't see any of the sheep. Imagine everything around you. They could have gone absolutely anywhere. Where are they? How do I even try to find these people? They're not even my sheep. They're other people's sheep. Where could they have been? But I remember that in this flock there were a couple of goats. And they were, you know, goats aren't really a very reliable animal. And they're always walking around, moving around. And then the sheep will follow the goats. And so the goats probably took the sheep to some direction. I have no idea where. But as I was walking, I happened to see a guy on a horse who had seen the entire flock. And he said, they went that way. So I ran, I'm sweating, full of stress. And so whoever is uh, leading the flock uh, determines a lot. <laughs> need to follow Jesus, not the goats. So it tells us what a good shepherd should look like in John 10. But here in Ezekiel 34, Oh, wait, no, 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 sorry. We're still in John 10. He's giving a parable. Why does Jesus use parables? Right, imagine if you're trying to teach a child something, we try to go down to their level to make it understandable for them. So we use words that are simple that they can get, not anything super deep. 
Same thing with Jesus, he uses a very accessible language with people. So imagine in Israel there were tons of sheep everywhere. So sheep were very accessible, right? You'd eat the sheep. A lot of them were used for sacrifices on holidays. And so these sheep would usually live a very long time and they would know them by name, the shepherds. In our country, one year we have them and then we kill them and then we, we forget about them. But these pastors, they knew every sh shepherds, they knew every sheep by their name. And so actually this chapter 10 is really just a continuation of chapter 9, if you remember, where Jesus is having a problem with the Pharisees. When he heals the blind man in John 9, remember the, the Pharisees started to try to condemn him. But uh, God the Father had already talked a long time ago through the prophet Ezekiel many centuries ago about the shepherds of Israel. So in Ezekiel 34, chapter, oh, chapter 34, verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, This is what the Lord God says. Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should the shepherds not feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you searched for the lost, but with force and with violence you have dominated them. So at home, read the entire uh, chapter uh, of Ezekiel, chapter 34. So there had already been a prophecy about the true uh, shepherd who would come. Then I will appoint over them one shepherd, verse 23, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. When God was writing this through Ezekiel, there wasn't David. David had already died. But this was talking that, that Jesus would become the king. John 10, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and a robber. So there was a door. Hang on. Hang on. Okay, so we're talking about the door for the sheep. So there were people who would who would jump over the side of the wall and not through the door. So there was a lot of verses in the Old Testament about uh, the Messiah who was going to come. Even in Psalm 22, it Psalm 23 for us. But the people who come in by the way, they are thief and robber. What is a robber? A thief is someone who takes something that does not belong to them. The Pharisees here were the thief and the robbers. They were against the true Messiah. They were against that Jesus came. So Jesus is showing the difference between the false shepherds, the false pastors, and the true. So whoever hears the voice of the Messiah, Remember when Jesus uh, came in the beginning and called his disciples? 
when he calls the blind man in John chapter 9, these people heard Jesus' voice and they followed him. The blind guy didn't just receive a healing, right, to his have his sight, he received salvation. So it's the same way that we're the people who have heard the voice of the true shepherd and we have followed him. In the third verse, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep listen to his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So here actually Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, John the Baptist who uh, had gone before Jesus. When he puts all his own sheep outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. So the shepherd is only going to go where he has already been, where he's willing to go himself. He doesn't just send them out. He knows exactly where to lead them. Jesus, the same way, is always in front of his flock, and he's always leading them. In the fifth verse, however, a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. So there's this instinct uh, of the sheep to run away from the voice of the stranger. In verse 6, Jesus told them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what the things which he was saying to them meant. So Jesus is showing them that these Pharisees, they're not part of his flock. They are blind. Their ears, they can't hear. They were sheep, not of his fold, the Pharisees. We come to the first I am in our chapter, in verse 7 and 8. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All those who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. And so again, Jesus talks about uh, his greatness that there's actually a lot of false teachings now in the world where people say that, oh, there's one God, and we all believe in the same God. But then if you say, no, 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 there's a, there are different gods in different religions, well, then you'll be judged and you'll be criticized in this world. But any, any religion or belief that says that you do not need Jesus to get to heaven is a liar. Same thing, anyone who says that it's not just through Jesus that you can get to heaven, anyone who says that is also a liar. The scripture says that without Jesus there is no salvation. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. This relates to everyone. This is to the Jews, the Greeks, the Gentiles. And we need to ask ourselves, have we come through the door? Chapter 9, verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. It's one of the... He's already said, secondly, that he is the door. And mainly that through him, only through him, you can be saved. He invites everyone, but to actually receive salvation, you must go through that door, who is Jesus. You must receive him in faith. It's a personal decision. Without that, there is no salvation. So an interesting verse is number 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. So a lot of this, uh, usually this verse is used to describe the devil. When we talk about the enemy and the devil. And yes, he is accurately describing the devil, but 
this is supposed to be about the Pharisees. He is calling this out in relation to the Pharisees. These false teachers, these Pharisees, they are workers of Satan. Verse 11, about the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. Oops. Do you remember Brother Alexei from Easter? He talked about that a lot of times we see this picture of Jesus as really kind and he's nice and he's kind of soft and cuddly. But remember, Jesus actually isn't that. He is powerful. He is just. When we started to read John, and for chapter 2, I, I saw how Jesus uh, cleared the temple of the 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 sellers and traders. He comes into the temple. It's a huge, huge place. There's this giant market in there. And there's men, right? Healthy, big men at these tables. But then Jesus, right? It says he makes a whip of cords. He just makes the whip. And it's said that he drives them out of the of the temple. How much power do you need? How much authority do you need to send out a crowd of men who are usually used to being there? How much power does it take to get them out? It's not being kind and good. It's power. And he's driving them out. So the expression of good shepherd, what does that mean here? Uh, there's a Greek word, kaos or something, for the good part of good shepherd. It means that the best, you're great, you're incredible. It's the, it means that he's the best shepherd, best shepherd you could imagine. So why is he good? Because he gave his own life. We know that in Israel that sheep were used as sacrifices and that the sometimes you would have to sacrifice the sheep for the shepherd. So the shepherd would take his sheep and then use it as a sacrifice to cover his sins. It's the usual practice. But here, here the shepherd sacrifices himself for the sheep. It's, it's completely backwards to what we're used to. He gave his life for me and for you. In verse 12 and 13. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters the flock. He flees because he is a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. He's talking about people who keep the sheep for money. But if there's any danger, they leave and they just abandon the flock. Do you remember in 1 Samuel when it talks about David as a boy who protected, he says, I protected my father's flock against the bear and the lion. Why? Because he wasn't a hired hand. Those were his. It's the same way with Jesus. We are his. Jesus is the perfect shepherd. He doesn't just know us by name. He protects us and cleans us. Verse 
So think about whoever serves in your family, you serve at work, you serve in the church. This is the great uh, example for us how to serve. And so we need to ask God truly, uh, God, give us the heart of the pastor, of the shepherd, not of a hired hand, that we can look like Jesus Christ. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. So Jesus is saying again that I'm the good shepherd, but it's important that you know, I know my own, and my own know me. In my life, I give for my sheep. It's really interesting and important because there's a lot of uh, debates. Who did Jesus die for? Oh, well, he died for everyone. He died for every sinner. Yes, that's true. But he died for his sheep. He died for us. So the sheep are the people. The people that have been uh, predestined and called by God who will follow him. In Matthew 1, verse 21, She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. His people, these chosen people, not everyone. Jesus Christ knows his own people. He knows everyone, but, but it's the people that he has that he knows better. And we are with him. Praise God. Verse 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus repeats this many, many times where he connects uh, himself with the Father. The Father's will, and that he has come to fulfill the Father's will in laying down his life for our salvation. In the verse 16, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. What's this talking about? It's about us. This is us. We are the Gentiles. Jesus is saying that there's no difference now between nationalities. It, it was crazy to them, these Israelites, to think that everybody could be a part of God's family. But through His blood, we have the opportunity to become the people of God, one in Christ. Verse 17 and 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. He's God. Jesus has the power to give his life. He also had the power to bring his life up again, to resurrect on the third day and give us salvation and eternal life. In verse 19, dissension occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the words of one who was demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of those who are blind, can it? Jesus was the only perfect man on the earth, right? The human heart is so ruined and twisted that they would call Jesus demon-possessed. It's stupid. Maybe for some of you, you thinking that, hearing that Jesus is the Son of God, you think it's, it's nonsense, but this is, this isn't stupidity. If you think it's stupid and and you don't receive Christ, there are going to be consequences for this. 
We always need to call on God. We need to call on Jesus to save us, that He become our shepherd. So dear brothers and sisters, here's the final thing about our, our good shepherd. This is my opinion. Maybe this isn't in the scriptures, but for me, when I read this word, this is how I'm encouraged. In all times, if the shepherd dies, the whole flock dies. Right? It's it makes sense. Right? If a bear kills the the shepherd, then the whole flock is gonna is gonna eventually suffer and die. But Jesus is perfect that he would die on the cross, rise on the third day, ascend into heaven, but then in place of himself, what does he give? He gives the Holy Spirit. We have not been left alone. We are the shepherd. We have a we are the sheep. We are we have a shepherd. We have the Holy Spirit. He is our helper. Our counselor. Praise God. And so here are the three points of this uh, sermon here. The first is the door to the kingdom of heaven uh, is only through Jesus Christ. If you still don't know who Jesus is today, you need to you need to go to him. Maybe after the sermon, come to talk to us. We'll, we'll, we'll pray. Maybe you'll repent. The second point is we need to know the voice of our shepherd, Jesus Christ, and follow him. Jesus needs to go before us and we need to follow him. We need to know his voice and follow it. And the third one is it's important to try to become like Jesus Christ in our service. Right? Every one of us, we are all potential pastors of a, of a sense. Whether you're in worship, maybe you're in children's ministry, Whatever you're in, you're leading people. It's your family, it's your children. And who should we look like? What what example should we be giving? Of course, it's Jesus Christ. We know our perfect shepherd, we know his voice. In our life, there can be a lot of different trials and tests. Maybe right now some of you are going through some difficulties and trials. I myself had a time where it wasn't an easy period. It encouraged me that the Holy Spirit was with us, that Jesus is before me, out in front of me. And I encourage you all to trust him, follow his voice, go after him. and we'll go into salvation to him. He's here with us, amen. Father God, all praise, honor, and glory go to you. We are thankful for this day. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, that you are with us. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, to praise you, to talk with our brothers and our sisters, and that we have a time to listen to your word. Thank you that you teach us of how to be a good shepherd. You teach us even though we're so imperfect, but we're trying to be like you. Give us power. Give us the power to follow you in this crazy world. We completely need and depend on you, God. We ask you that all of our sufferings and needs and worries, God, will we just put them at your feet? God, because you're the good shepherd. 
You are the perfect shepherd. You're with us in anything. And we are so grateful, Lord God. We praise your holy name. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our church. Thank you for Shandrak. That here, we have a relationship with you. Thank you for all these brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen.